All right. Uh, welcome to another installment of our uh, weekly online Bible study uh, that we put out in the middle of the week. And uh, as far as I know, this is uh, number four in our series. We've been talking about Christian fellowship. And Christian fellowship from the perspective of the Bible includes having to talk about uh, the Greek word koinonia. The Greek word koinonia we mentioned in the first episode uh, is related to several different concepts. It's, it's not just a simple word that we, we look at and we say, okay, well, if we want to do fellowship, we need to get together in a social way. Well, that's part of it, but that's not the whole story. And so we mentioned that there are four distinct English words that translators have used to talk about the Greek phrase or word koinonia. In that, um, as we understand fellowship, it's deeper and, and a, it's a wider word, a wider concept than what I think sometimes we're used to. And so last week we really talked about encouragement, lifting one another up. We used uh, the passage in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, let us consider how we may spur one another on uh, toward love and good deeds and not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. And we mentioned that uh, probably for the early church, that was more of a small group uh, concept at that point, house churches eating together like they were doing it's not saying don't go to church, but it's saying don't, don't give up meeting together with other Christians for fellowship. Uh, and then uh, let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's a sense of urgency there. Uh, we talked about as long as it's called today, we should do it. And then we use this uh, great quote from uh, J.I. Packer. Uh, we should not think of our fellowship with other Christians as a spiritual luxury, an optional addition to the exercises of private devotion. We should recognize rather that such fellowship is a spiritual necessity. For God has made us in such a way that our fellowship with him is fed by our fellowship with fe fellow Christians and requires us to be so fed constantly for its own deepening and enrichment. So the idea is if we want deep and rich fellowship with God, and the Bible backs this up. Jab Packer is basing this on his understanding of the New Testament then. Uh, what happens is God chooses us to be in fellowship with others in the church and that that in many ways is how God speaks to us. Uh, but it is to say that God chooses to work through um, other Christians to strengthen our faith with him. And, and, and really that strengthens our faith with, with each other and we're, we're much stronger in that sense. So uh, what I want us to do is kind of take a, a dive into this week's uh, passage, and we'll be looking at another word, not fellowship, for um, the Greek word koinonia. So I want to read in first uh, in Philippians chapter one, rather, a few verses uh, three through five, and let's see if you can pick out the word uh, that gets translated. Paul is thanking the Philippian church. This is in a part of the greeting, and he says, "I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, because He had spent some time there and, and knows many of the people." Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. So he says, I remember you. And when I remember you in the time and every prayer, it brings about joy. So he's praying with joy for them. And then he says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, so the word there uh, we're talking about is the word partnership. And if you look at the way the Greek word, and we're not diving too far into this, so, so don't, don't, don't lose me now, Okay. But when the Greek word is talking about building each other up, lifting each other up, doing things that are kind of an inward focus among, among the church, and the word that he uses is, is fellowship. When God is talking about, when, when, when the Old Testament, uh, people that translate into English see that God is talking about not just the inward building up of the faith, but as Paul describes here, a partnership uh, for building the gospel when Paul's not really even literally in their presence anymore. Then it talks about a, a partnership, uh, using the word partnership instead of fellowship. So if you look through the Old Testament, there's really two concepts in how we build the church. There's, there's really uh, a fellowship, which has to do with our inward mission of building each other up, uh, forming a tight, cohesive church. But it's not only an inward focus. Uh, fellowship is not only an inward focus. The New Testament's not only an inward focus. The Old Testament's not only an inward focus. We have an inward mission to build each other up, to lift each other up, to do all of those things that we're supposed to do. We also have an outward mission, okay? Because just as we have an inward fellowship, we need to invite people into that inward fellowship. The Great Commission is Jesus saying, go out into all the world and all nations and make disciples. So he's saying, go out and, and invite other people in. 
And there's other parables in the New Testament that we could talk about, about going out and, and it, it really is. So we have two missions there. We have the inward mission and the outward mission. When, they, when we're talking about the inward mission, we say things like fellowship. When we're talking about the outward mission, we're really talking about um, what um, is, a, is a working relationship to get a, another mission done. Even the inward is a working relationship, but especially as it regards an outward um, focus, then we're talking about um, the working relationship. So here's the idea. Uh, Paul is a missionary. Paul is going around founding churches, strengthening churches, writing to churches, doing all of these things. And the Philippian church reached out and is sending uh, to him material possessions and uh, gifts, as he would refer to them. And he says at one point, he said, um, you know, not that I need gifts for my purpose, but I seek gifts uh, really that benefit you. In other words, he thought that the Philippian church giving him would one day in heaven work to their account, okay? It would show their generosity and their gratitude. And he thought that obviously, and, and it's a, a, a theme throughout the Old and New Testament that giving benefits the giver. It's not giving is even giving to God as, well, I've given to you, now I'm, I'm out. Um, but it is giving to you and, and giving away and giving to, to alms to the poor, giving offerings to God, giving your tithe, things like that is really something that increases you. Now that seems uh, counterintuitive. It seems like an oxymoron. We could go on and, and use a lot of fancy words to say. Those two don't seem the same, but really Paul is saying here, listen, if you give to me, you partner with me in founding all of these churches. When we get to heaven, people aren't just gonna say, look at Paul founded all these churches. They're gonna say, look at Paul founded all these churches and look at all these faithful people who had a, a role in that. And there's a sense where in heaven, we get to share in the prize of the work done by those oriented to the outward mission field. And, and what we'll say here is that not everybody's called to be a missionary to a foreign land uh, in the same way that Paul was. Paul was going from, from area to area planting churches. And so we often think, well, I can't be a missionary, so I'm, I'm out of the cause. And that's really not the case. We have two opportunities, and, and the slide that you're seeing mentions kind of both of them. With partnership in the outward mission, we have partnership in giving and partnership in prayer. And, and Paul uses those two things throughout at least seven times in his letters to different people at different times. He mentions getting prayer from people uh, and, and uh, the prayers that were offered and that meant something to him or just a command to pray for him, you know, as he's sent out asking for support. We'll read a couple of those in just a minute because they're, they're super important to, to our conversation here. But there's also um, partnership in, in actual giving and so of resources. Now, if you look at the two of those, partnership and giving, some people financially supported the work that he was doing. Um, he says at one point, not that I needed it, but to, it, it's gonna get added to your account. So it, when he's talking about partnership and giving, when he's talking about partnership and prayer, there's only one of those things he said he can get by without. He's look, if you don't choose to help me meet those things, God can use somebody else. But with prayer, he says, I count on that. I need that prayer. We, we need to go together in prayer. And so uh, we could spend a little bit of time reading uh, later in the chapter, Philippians 1, but verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So every place he went, he met obstacles. Now he met financial obstacles. He needed to pay for things. He's paying his way, uh, doing doing the things that he needed to. Ministry costs money. We're aware of that. And a lot of us don't want to talk about money and that's fine too. But he, he encountered spiritual uh, obstacles, spiritual people who were against him. And he said, listen, if I'm going to uh, uh, you know, overcome these obstacles, I need a partnership with you. And in that way, they were joining together in fellowship. And we don't see that as fellowship because we're not with somebody and we don't see it in that way. Um, there was a quote, and, and it's included in the book that I've been uh, referencing, Jerry Bridges' True Community. But there's a quote from a, a man named S.D. Gordon on the importance of prayer and really for missions. He said, the greatest thing each of us can do is to pray. If we can go personally to some distant land, still we've gone to one place, only one place. But prayer puts us in a, a direct dynamic touch with the world. So a man can go aside today, shut his door, spend a half hour in, in, of his life in India for God as though he were there in person. So what he's saying is, listen, if I go to my closet and I'm praying for a missionary in India, it's as if I went there for God to be a missionary because I'm bringing, and he calls it, um, 
He says this, uh, as though I there in person, surely uh, you and I must get more half hours for this secret service. Okay, so the service of, of God for his missionaries is for us to intercede on their behalf. Strengthen them, help them overcome. If we give, help them overcome the financial uh, boundaries and, and, and burdens and things that they have to, obstacles that they have to overcome. But in prayer, we're talking about the spiritual burdens and obstacles and things they have to overcome. And they're both necessary. Any, any missionary uh, will say, and on their card, it'll say financial giving and it'll say prayer support. So financial support, obviously, they need uh, because life costs money. And if they're giving up their life here to go there, I would argue that at foreign missions or people who, who, who um, apply themselves to the mission field uh, can do so in our backyard. Uh, people hungry, that's a mission field. People homeless, that's a mission field. There are mission fields all over the United States of America. There are mission fields in Chatham County, Randolph County, Alamance County, all around, Orange County, you know, Wake County. There are mission fields. And those aren't necessarily in the church, they're, they're, but they can be right next to the church, can't they? Uh, people who need to be brought into fellowship. And so what would hurt us? You say, well, I don't know any missionaries from India, but do you know anybody who runs a homeless shelter? Do you know anybody that owns an orphanage? Do you know anybody that owns a food pantry? And what if you partnered with them? You say, I don't have a whole lot of money. That's great. So, you know, Paul mentioned uh, in his um, uh, letters a lot, prayer ministry. And it's not to be belittled. In many ways, if you don't have financial resources to give, you could pray that God might uh, inspire somebody to give to, to that ministry. And so in that way, you might even be affecting their financial uh, thing, even if you can't give yourself. But to give of your time, uh, to give of your heart, to give of your prayer. And so, um, you know, Paul is confident that it's going to turn out for his deliverance. Uh, there's another in 2 Thessalonians 5, 25. He just says this to the church. He said, brothers, pray for us. It's not at the beginning of the, the passage. It's uh, a part of the closing and the conclusion of his passage. And he says, listen, part of what I'm doing and part of what you're doing, you can partner with me if you'll just pray for me. And so there's something uh, important there. Uh, we go again to the book of Romans. We're just going to hit several passages of Scripture here. Uh, so I appeal to you, brothers, uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers. It's interesting that he doesn't say pray for me in that sense. He says strive in your prayers. So if we were to pick out a couple of things that's important about the prayers, uh, the partnership in prayer, what would that be? If we were to pick out something about giving financially, it would be don't just write a check but be involved. If it were something about prayer, how about the same thing? Don't just pray a prayer but be involved in prayer strive in prayer. He says, uh, in your, uh, uh, strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. And he's specifically saying, pray on my behalf that I may be delivered from the uh, evil, from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So he said, he's saying, pray for me. But as he's saying, pray for me, he says, pray specifically for these things that I need. Now, it's one thing to say, okay, for, we'll pray for all our missionaries. Okay, which missionaries? Okay, well, let's pick a missionary. And then you might say, well, Daniel, I don't know what to pray for. Okay, well, you know, missionaries that go around usually send out newsletters and usually send out email newsletters at this point. And every month you get one of those, you could pray for them and pray specifically. They'll include, these are the things that are going on that you could pray for. And so you begin to connect yourself with that. There's a fellowship. There is a fellowship in praying for somebody, even if you don't know them, sometimes when they come back on furlough, you get an opportunity. But you're praying specifically for the things that are going on in their lives. What if, you know, and I've, I've been in the past to a place where I got a newsletter from a missionary and I thought one more thing to read. But there are times when I joined together with missionaries and praying for them that when I got the next update, I couldn't wait to read it because I wanted to know how somebody was sick. I want to know how they're doing. This a mission field was struggling. I want to know if they found a leader for that mission field. This was going on and I want to know. And then I update my prayers and I continue. Believe it or not, there's a deep fellowship. And we said before, getting together, being in person, sharing, asking questions, important element of fellowship for inward. Yeah, that's true. For outward, we rely even more heavily on a spiritual fellowship, a spiritual connection whereby God can join us together with other people, even though they might not even know our name or that we're praying for them on that day. It's helpful if they do, but they might not. Uh, First Thessalonians, there's another one. Uh, finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored 
uh, as happened among you, so that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. Here again, he's saying something very specific. Uh, the speed, you know, the Lord may speed ahead. The word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. So there's a, an effectiveness and efficiency there. And then delivered from wicked and evil men. Why? Everywhere missionaries go, and this can be in the inner city uh, for a homeless mission. This could be overseas. Uh, there's opposition. Okay. Otherwise, everybody would have been doing it, and the word of God would be spreading there. The word of God in the places that it's not spreading, in the place where there's darkness, it's because light has been impeded, and there's obstacles to light. So what God needs is absolutely people from our generations uh, to agree to be missionaries and to go out. I believe God still calls people to a life in a mission field. That life may be where you work and you never get paid a day in your life as a missionary, but you, where you work is a mission field. It may be, um, you know, the, the, the homeless shelter, maybe the food pantry, it may be the orphanage. Good gracious. Uh, there's so many people uh, that have needs um, in situations like that. And so we need to open our eyes to the mission fields in our neighborhood, in our community, uh, the, the development up the road, um, parents struggling maybe with raising their kids. There's a mission field there. There's mission fields all over. And so we might pray for the word of the Lord to have speed ahead of us and ahead of our work so that when we go there and do the things that God might be calling us to do. So there's ample opportunities uh, for partnership. Uh, if you do much studying in, in, in mission fields, You'll hear about a man named William Carey. Um, William Carey was a missionary in England, <clears throat> and um, he was called the father of modern missions because he decided to be called. He decided that he had been called to India, and as he went to India, he began traveling there uh, in 1793. So this is a while back. Uh, he prayed for the needs of the unreached world. There was a commissioning held for him in 1793. And one of Carey's friends exclaimed, there's a gold mine in India, but it seems almost as deep as the center of the earth. And to which Carey replied, and it's almost like, a, like this mine, right? And, and people have to go into the mine and, and dig out the, the gold and bring it back up. Carey said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I will venture down. He said, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to be the missionary. But remember that you must hold the ropes. And so the ideas of, of the miners, you know, if you got down and got trapped, somebody was there to pull you back out. Somebody was there to offer that support. Somebody was there to be a lifeline to you and you needed it. Every missionary on every mission field needs somebody to hold the ropes. They need the partner in Christ. And, and what I want to say again is, you know, we're going to look at these uh, study questions in just a minute. Uh, but what I want to say to you is God might be very well calling you to a mission field. He might not. You may say, okay, that, that, that part of my life's gone. I've, I've picked my choices. I am where I am. God still might call you to partner with somebody who's doing missions. And, and I don't want you to think about just missions being for a mission field, although that's possible. Uh, interestingly enough, people in other countries are talking about sending missionaries to America now. So, so everything goes back and forth. Um, but... What, what, God might be, what, what might God be showing you in a way that you could partner with somebody uh, that you haven't thought about before? Um, is there somebody who you could maybe financially bless? $5 a month goes a long way, but, but when you get that $5 check in the mail as a, somebody who's in a, in a mission field, you know that that person's on your side. You know that that's a partner, uh, that that's a partner that you have in the spread of the gospel. So, so whatever their fruit is from that ministry, uh, you'll get to share with that in heaven. You'll get to share with the accolades. The, the, when, when somebody says, oh, look at all of these things that were done by this person. You know, you'll be shown as somebody who had a part to play in that. And you say, well, you know, that might not be much. Well, it's not much. And it's not going to cost you an awful lot. Uh, financial resources for some time, if you were to pray for that person. Uh, so certainly some of your time. Um, but it's out of the abundance of the blessing of God that we get called to give back. And so if God has blessed you abundantly with financial resources, where might you help support others? Maybe God has blessed you with time to sit around and, and you have all the time in the world and you're thinking about, man, what, what do I do? Um, you know, spend some of that time in prayer. So if you had an opportunity to pray for somebody in India, go spend 30 minutes in India with that person praying for them that God might advance the gospel partner with them in that sense. Maybe you find somebody online and you're able to send them an email saying, hey, listen, I spent 30 minutes praying for you today. For those who are on the front lines of, of the mission field, wherever they happen to be, foreign missions, uh, local missions, those kind of things mean a lot. So let's think about where, where God might be calling us into deeper fellowship inwardly with, with those in our church. Uh, and let's talk about fellowship outwardly, working partnership 
uh, with those who are advancing the gospel because uh, God needs us to be uh, involved in both aspects of that um, fellowship. So uh, anyway, we, stay tuned. We're going to have a few um, study questions here in a minute, and I'll play those, and, um, and, and hopefully you'll take a chance to read those and, and ask those questions to yourself or to whoever might be uh, going through this Bible study with you, maybe if you're doing it uh, with somebody else. But uh, anyway, I hope that you're doing well. That's another installment. We'll see you again uh, next week. 